today's conference. Today's call is also being recorded. If we have any objections, you may disconnect. Now I'd like to turn it to Trent Frazier. Sir, you may begin. Thank you, and thank you to you for joining the National Protection and Programs Director at Cybersecurity Job and Internship Webinar this afternoon. My name is Trent Frazier. I'm the Executive Director for the Office of Academic Engagement here with the Department of Homeland Security. We're very excited to be hosting today's webinar. My office is charged with helping to connect the department with the higher education community, and we host events like this regularly. Just a couple of instructions before we get started today. Participants will be muted on the phone line during the presentation. So if you have questions for our presenters, please use the question and answer chat box at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the presentation, we will answer as many questions as we can. If we are not able to get through all of the questions that were submitted through the chat box, we will include responses to those questions in an email following today's session. Of course, if you have any technical issues, Please also submit those to our, through the chat box for our online moderators who will be available to assist you. The chat box is private and can only be seen by our online moderators. So please, if you have any problems, just let them know and they will work with you to resolve them. So to get started today, I want to give you a quick overview of today's webinar. We're going to talk a little bit about the National Protection and Programs Directorate itself and specifically our cyber organization. We'll talk about the benefits and perks for working with the Department of Homeland Security and with MPPD, and talk about some of the career paths that are available for students. We also want to talk about cyber education and training resources, and then give you some tips on how to prepare your resume and ultimately to apply for positions or internships with the department. After we get through all of that, we're going to give you uh, an opportunity to answer some questions, uh, and we'll work through those at the end of today's session. So to get us started, I want to introduce Amanda Martens, uh, a human resources specialist with NPPD, and Princess Young, one of our IT specialists. Amanda and Princess, please. Okay, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We're happy to be here. Um, real quick, we wanted to talk a little bit about National Protection Programs Directorate, who we are, uh, what our mission is. Um, we partner with federal, state, local, and tribal governments, as well as the private sector, in order to protect and secure the people, places, spaces, data, and networks that make America run. Our daily efforts make the nation's cyber and physical infrastructure more secure and resilient. And our nation is vulnerable to an ever-evolving range of threats, and these range from terrorist attacks to cyber attacks and even natural disasters. Reducing the risks from these threats is really what NTPD is all about. Today we'll be talking about critical infrastructure and why the DHS MPPD mission is so important, and you may be asking yourself right now, what is critical infrastructure? Well, we know it as the power that we use in our homes, the water that we drink, our transportation systems, the stores we shop in, and our communication systems that allow us to talk to our friends and family, and these are things that we use every single day. And these are essential services that make up our economy, our security, and our health. NPPD is comprised of five major offices, and we're going to talk about them just real quickly. So we have the Federal Protective Service, and SPS provides integrated security and law enforcement services to more than 9,500 federal facilities nationwide. Simply put, they protect the federal workforce and the federal buildings that we own uh, from hazards and threats. The Office of Biometric Identity Management provides biometric identi identification services that help federal, state, and local government decision makers accurately identify the people they encounter. And then we determine to make sure uh, whether or not those people pose a risk to the United States. OVIM supplies the technology for collecting this data. Uh, they store it, they provide analysis, update the watch list, and ensure integrity of the data. Then there's the Office of Cyber Infrastructure and Analysis. And OCIA uses an integrated analytical approach to evaluate the potential consequences of disruption from physical or cyber threats. And this analysis is used to inform decisions that protect the nation's critical infrastructure. CSNC, the Office of Cybersecurity Communications, so this is where the vast majority of our cyber positions are. Uh, and in a minute, we'll be going over each of the divisions in CSNC um, in greater detail. And finally, we have the Office of in Infrastructure Protection. And IP leads and coordinates national programs and policies on critical infrastructure, security, and resilience, and has established strong partnerships across the government and the private sector. 
the office conducts and facilitates vulnerability and consequence assessments. And this helps um, critical infrastructure owners and operators to understand and address risks that may be to critical infrastructure. All right, so now moving on to where I'm a little bit biased personally, CS and C. And you kind of are asking yourself, well, what does cybersecurity and communications do? And as Amanda said, we are really charged with protecting the cyber and the telecommunications aspects of the critical infrastructure that impact us on a daily basis. And why is that important? Well, we actually look to protect the .gov domain. And if you really think about it, the .gov domain impacts every American, whether it's through their health records, through their PII, the personally identifiable, identifiable information, um, and things like that. And so we actually have kind of this huge spectrum of customers that we support. It's the folks that are owners and operators of that system, and we need to work with them through breaches and also hopefully preventing breaches from happening. And we also have to work with everyone that touches that. We like to say that cybersecurity is a shared responsibility. So from your grandparents, your parents, your siblings, yourselves, your educators, and, and your teachers, and your friends and family, everyone has a touch point uh, with cs &C in some way. And we really love that because we are uh, pretty public facing in a lot of ways. Um, so that being said, you kind of might ask yourself, well, who is the ideal candidate for cs and c Well, if you're technical, no matter where you are, I want you to raise your hand. We're looking for you. And if you're a little less technical and have some other transferable skills, I want you to raise your hand because we're looking for you as well. So this is kind of a little mock-up of some of the folks that we are looking for. And as you can see, it runs the gamut because, as I mentioned, it's a shared responsibility. We need all kinds of folks. So we have everyone from IT specialists, such as myself, um, who manages um, a pretty awesome program that we'll get into a little bit later, um, as well as everything from digital forensics to the computer engineers, pen testers, um, as well as awareness and outreach. So, you know, it's very important to have the technical folks on the team as well and bringing that knowledge and awareness. But at the same time, we also need people who can communicate and they can deal with crisis management and they can help uh, technically write documents that might one day be documentation that fits into policy. So we really are looking for all kinds um, and that includes all of you on the webinar today. So that being said, Amanda is actually going to start off the next section and we're going to break down what CS and C looks like um, from a division level. So where are you, Amanda? So the first division we're going to talk about is the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. We just call it the NCIC. So, so the, much easier. So much easier. <laughs> the NCIC's mission is to reduce the number and the severity of incidents that could comprise our critical infrastructure. And so the NCIC is really where the more technical positions, the hands-on keyboard positions um, are located. And the NCIC works really as an information sharer. They share information about um, cyber threats um, to um, all kinds of stakeholders, private and, and public. And to highlight just a few of some of the smaller teams in the NCIC, um, one team is called the National Assessment and Technical Services Team. We call them NCATS. Um, so this team, they really are um, testing and searching federal websites for their um, pen testers. Um, and they search for vulnerabilities. And then they make recommendations to the agencies on how they can um, better improve their cybersecurity posture. And so this is the team that tells organizations how they could be hacked. The Hunt and Incident Response Team provides intrusion analysis to stakeholders who require assistance after they've been attacked. Um, this is the team that tells an organization how they have been hacked. And they also give information um, to other organizations about how to mitigate that attack. Can I just add one really quick thing? Because some of you um, definitely are not from the East Coast, and you might kind of be wondering, well, where are you all located? So a lot of our services do take place in the Washington, D.C. area or the National Capital Region. But actually with NCIC, there are even positions in Florida, in Idaho, if you can believe it, um, as well as a few other sites that we work with pretty regularly. So just know that the opportunities to work with our, our division are pretty expansive. 
Um, and then we have the Office of Emergency Communications, and uh, we call them OEC. OEC has a really big, important job. Um, they work to support and promote communications that are used by our emergency responders. And basically, they coordinate emergency communications. They do planning exercises and preparedness. They do evaluation on all of their exercises. Um, and then they have uh, tools and training services and guidance that they provide to communities and to other stakeholders. And all of this is to help uh, organizations and communities be able to communicate when there is an emergency. Um, Ensuring that first responders can talk to each other, that's really the first critical step that you need to address when there is some kind of an emergency. And as the team likes to say, there's no cyber without fiber. I'm going to have to start using that myself. Yeah. So our next division is the Stakeholder Engagement and Cyber Infrastructure Resilience, or we lovingly call it SEEKER. And that's actually the office that I sit within, so I'll try not to go into a huge monologue. But what I love about SEEKER is we really feel like, in a lot of ways, we're the public-facing role, and we are the people people um, of, of CSNC. And why? Well, as I mentioned, as I keep saying, cyber is a shared responsibility. And so what do you do in those situations where Maybe you're going to small town Oklahoma and you're trying to uh, do a pen test or you're trying to establish a relationship um, with people in a region that maybe don't deal with government that often or don't have the cyber infrastructure established yet. Well, you're going to hopefully use our team um, because we have uh, some expertise in that exact thing, dealing with those crisis management situations, those change management, um, those communication opportunities where Sometimes people just need talking points on how to work with their CEOs or with their mayors and governors and their CISOs, if you will. Um, so our office really looks at building relationships. That's why I said also if you like to talk, that might be a great uh, area for you because we are all about spreading awareness of the resources that CSNC has to offer. And that includes everything from training, outreach, and awareness, um, as well as assessments that we can provide. Um, bonus points, if you know how many FEMA regions um, are across the country. If you didn't know, there are 10. We even have folks out in the field across the FEMA regions who are kind of those boots on the ground and ensure that um, there is that representation out in the field. So again, we can establish those relationships um, and help prevent things before they go wrong and also be there for, unfortunately, when they do. Um, next, our uh, additional division is the Federal Network Resilience. Um, and what I love is FNR also does a fair amount of stakeholder outreach, but they're actually focused on federal government engagement, um, which is really important because think about when executive orders come out and they mandate the federal government to do something new. Um, you need a support system. And so we are kind of that backbone that helps walk government entities through those types of changes and situations. Um, SNR does everything from assisting with that cyber risk management piece as well as even offering training and technical assistance um, because, again, not every government agency is created equal. So everyone is dealing with their own issues. Um, so SNR is dealing oftentimes with the um, cyber offices within the other, other divisions dealing with those federal CISOs and CIOs. Um, so there's some very cool interactions if you kind of like the policy piece mixed with the cybersecurity piece. Um, and then also just that strategic engagement and helping agencies think a little more forward uh, when maybe cybersecurity is not at the forefront of their mind like it is us. We sleep, eat, and breathe cyber. All right. And then uh, the next and last division of, C of CSNC is NSD, and that's the Network Security Deployment. So as Amanda mentioned, NCIC is in charge of making sure um, that there's this coordinated effort across the country to prevent things from going wrong and being there um, if things do and help mitigate. But as you kind of could imagine, we're not necessarily just grabbing software off the shelf and using that to work with our stakeholders. We actually have to build things, sometimes from the ground up. So I like to think of NSD as kind of our internal software building um, and quality control team. So if you like to build programs and build um, 
detection, protection, um, and all the, above, all the above, I think NSD is a really good place for you. Um, if you happen to, her, uh, to hear of our National Cybersecurity Protection System, we love and we call it Einstein. We even have another, office, another part of it that's called Albert, so if you can kind of put it two together, you have a clever little naming convention there. We also have continuous diagnostics and mitigation, and that's looking at um, kind of managing real-time data and uh, kind of coming up in real time what threats are out there and spitting it out and translating it into kind of everyday layman's terms that an analyst can then use. And then, of course, enhanced cybersecurity services as well. And that's a voluntary information sharing program. So that is a really cool way for companies that might otherwise kind of be competitive to actually talk about the cyber issues they're facing in an anonymous way. So you don't have to deal with, okay, is another company going to um, exploit my issue so that they get a leg up? It allows everybody to talk um, and deal with the issues together in an anonymous fashion. Um, so with that, that is uh, CSNC, and I hope that one of those divisions piques your interest in some way um, and that, we, that you'll want to work there uh, because of it. And so if that is the next step, we want to make sure that you are well prepared to do that. So Amanda is now going to talk about kind of the benefits of working. If the job and, and the work that we do didn't already sound exciting enough, there's some pretty decent benefits in government, I have to say. Um, so, and I'm someone that came from outside of the D.C. area to come work out here. So um, she's going to cover some of the benefits you can um, hopefully be introduced to. So hopefully you thought that some of our uh, mission areas are exciting and challenging and um, you know, some of the work that is done here at NPPD and CSNC is really the only place you're going to find this type of work and the mission that we have here. Um, we work collaboratively across um, private industry and the federal sector, state governments, local governments. Um, we have flexible work schedules at DHS and NPPD. Uh, we have telework options. We have casual work environments. Um, we have a pretty generous annual leave package. Uh, we also have uh, wellness leave where um, our employees can take up to an hour three times a week to go down to the gym and they don't have to make that time up. Um, we have pretty comprehensive medical, dental, vision, life insurance. There's long-term care insurance. There's our flexible spending accounts and also thrift savings plan. Thrift savings plan is the government's version of a 401k um, and yes, there's matching. Um, at DHS, we have uh, access to an employee assistance plan. Um, so if you're ever going through a tough time, there's a counselor that you can reach out to. Um, DHS is really big on education and training and mentoring programs. We have a DHS-wide mentoring program. Um, we have leadership programs. Uh, and there's also opportunities to continue your education. Um, specifically at NPPD, uh, there's uh, never uh, a shortage of training opportunities. Um, and also, um, federal employees can qualify for a public loan service, um, public service loan forgiveness. And this is a program that's run by the Department of Education. Um, but basically, if you're uh, a qualifying federal employee, uh, you can, um, after you've worked 10 years and after you've made 10 years worth of payments, the balance of your federal loans may be forgiven. So. Lots of benefits and lots of perks to working for the government. And uh, so now uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, career paths for students and, and how to get your foot in the door. All right, so first off, we're going to talk about free money, and that is defined as scholarships. I think we all um, can appreciate scholarships and not having to have a whole lot of debt after you graduate. So I know a fair amount of you might be recent graduates, so you might be further along in your college career. So I'm going to talk about a few different opportunities, um, and hopefully, um, if you're lucky, maybe you even have an opportunity to apply for some of these options and, and apply some of, uh, to some of these options. So first off is a scholarship for service program. Um, and if there are any SFS schools out there, any students that are watching, hi, hope school is going really well for y'all. Um, but the SFS program actually provides scholarships to students who want to make a life um, or a career of public service. So um, as you can see on, on the slide, you actually are going to get um, a pretty wonderful scholarship that will cover everything from tuition, books, um, living stipend, even your health insurance, 
And sometimes that can even include conference attendance, certifications, and even technology depending on the school. So right now there is over 70 schools across the country that offer the SFS program, and there's about 600 students currently enrolled in these scholarship opportunities right now. So it's a pretty highly competitive opportunity, but you can do the SFS program in your bachelor's program, your master's, or your doctorate. It does depend on the school. So take a look at uh, the list on sfs.opm.gov. Check out if there's a school in your area that offers that program, or if you want to have an adventure and go somewhere else, consider it. Um, if you're already further along in your college career, I really um, hope that you'll also let people know about this SFS program. Um, whether you're a parent or teacher um, or just a good friend because it's a wonderful way to give back to your country. Um, and essentially what happens is you get paid to go to school for about one to two years um, and then in return you actually will give service back to the government and match the amount of time that you were in school. So if you're an undergrad right now and you want to continue your education, look into the master's program or if you're someone that wants to come back in and maybe work on their doctorate, please know that this is a wonderful way uh, for you to give back to your country and also get some money uh, to do so. That includes also an internship and uh, multiple job fairs so that you have a really great chance of getting into the government and making up that time. And I personally am an SFS alum and I can attest that you can survive and that it's a great program and hope that you'll consider it as well if you can. Next we have the Pathways programs. Um, and Pathways programs is really actually three separate programs. There's the intern program, the recent graduate program, and then the presidential management fellows program. And so you can see on the slide, each program really targets a different audience. Um, our intern program is for uh, our, our students who are currently enrolled, so you haven't graduated yet. And it doesn't matter what degree you're pursuing as long as you're enrolled. So even high schoolers. Uh, can come in under a Pathways internship. The minimum age is 16 years old in order to be eligible. Um, the one caveat is that you have to be an intern throughout your internship. So if you're getting ready to graduate, you might want to think about the recent graduate program. The recent graduate program is a one-year training and development uh, program where uh, you come in, uh, you can apply nine months prior to your graduation and up to two years after you graduate. And um, you're given training opportunities and development opportunities, and then if you successfully complete the program at the end of the year, you can convert to a uh, permanent position within the federal government. And you can also do that with the internship program. The internship program is meant to continue, so you're meant to intern until you graduate. And then at the end, uh, once you've graduated, you could be eligible as well to convert to a permanent employee, uh, permanent position. The Presidential Management Fellows Program, that's truly for advanced degree candidates. So that's <coughs> someone who is um, almost finished with their master's degree, um, a law degree, or even a PhD. <coughs> and this is a two-year program. So you can uh, um, start to apply to this program. It happens once a year, typically in the fall. Um, so you can apply up to nine months prior to your graduation and again up to two years after you've graduated with your advanced degree. And this is a two-year program where you're given, um, again, training opportunities and um, even are required to complete a rotational assignment as well as part of the development opportunity. And then again, if you successfully complete the program, you can convert, uh, be eligible to convert to a, a permanent position at the end of the two years. Um, these positions are posted on USA Jobs uh, when they do come out. NPVD posts our internship positions usually in the fall. Um, I've gotten some advance notice that DHS as a whole might be posting a uh, cyber internship uh, coming up in the next month or so, so that's a really good opportunity as well. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about resources for your education. Perfect. So as I already mentioned, SFS is a really great resource, but beyond that, let's take a look at some of the other ones that are available. Um, so as I mentioned, there's about uh, 70 schools across the country that offer the SFS scholarship, but if you take a look at your screen, you're going to see the whole United States map on there, and as you can see, a lot of it's green. Well, what does that green mean? That means that that 
state has a what we call center of academic excellence. And so these are schools that have been deemed by NSA and DHS as having high quality, top notch schools um, with pretty robust and wonderful cybersecurity programs. Again, if anyone is from a CAE school right now, shout out to you. Hope school is going well. Um, and if not, look into these schools if you have the chance. Um, as you can see, there might be one in your backyard. And also, this is a, a great opportunity for you to work with uh, pretty high-ranking faculty members, get hands-on experience. Sometimes these schools have pretty direct links to um, industry and government folks um, that will expose you to the real-world problems, help you be a part of the solution. Um, so take a look at those CAEs. As you can see on your screen, there's over 200, even some in Hawaii, which is pretty awesome. And next. We have the NICS website, and NICS stands for the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Careers and Studies. Um, we're the government, so we like acronyms. Sorry about that. Um, but now you know it to be the NICS portal. Um, and the NICS portal is kind of that one-stop shop for you when it, uh, when it comes to cybersecurity careers training opportunities. Um, this is a wonderful website for you if you're kind of looking at, well, what does the cybersecurity career path uh, look like for me? What kind of trajectory do I have? We have um, on there the cybersecurity workforce framework, known as the NICE framework. And you can actually take a look at uh, different categories of cybersecurity careers and kind of create a roadmap for yourself. So you can look and see, all right, if I want to be a malware analyst, where does that fall? And what kind of education do I need? And what kind of uh, skills or certifications might an employer be looking for? So definitely check out the NICS portal for that. And in addition to um, the framework, we also have a lot of cybersecurity training resources for you. So if you go online and you're thinking, okay, I might want to do my Security Plus, um, I might want to get that certification, but I want to do a boot camp so I can prepare for it. You can actually use the NICS portal and search over 3,000 approved embedded courses from a variety of vendors digitally um, as well as in-person options. And that will actually allow you from doing just a general search engine search, it will actually narrow down and show you um, training that could be in your backyard as well. Um, it will show you free and cost training um, and give you more information about those courses so that you can reach out to that vendor and secure that training opportunity. Um, there's also, if there's any HR folks on, on the webinar today or educators, there's a plethora of resources as well so that you can help uh, recruit and retain your cyber workforce of today and tomorrow. So pretty robust website. We hope you'll check it out. And then next, I just want to bring up quickly the FedVTE portal as well. Um, and this is a pretty uh, wonderful website that will also allow you to get some free training. I will caveat it and say that right now um, the site is open to federal and state and local government employees as well as military veterans. And so um, apologies if that doesn't apply to you quite yet, but we hope that you'll still recommend it to folks that fit under that category and we are looking to expand all the time. Um, so the FedVTE portal actually provides over 60 courses. Um, that are all cybersecurity focused. And some of these align to DOD standards. Help will, it will also help you kind of cross train for those certifications, as I mentioned. Um, and for veterans, it's awesome. For folks that want to cross train or retrain um, and get that added experience free of charge, if you are a veteran um, you, and you don't have a .mil or a .gov, you actually can work with our partner, Hire Our Heroes, um, who will help validate and confirm your government service. And it's as easy as that. And so we hope that you'll uh, log in. And the, great, the greatest part, too, you can do it from your phone. It's on-demand training, so you can start and stop. And right now we have about, for every two courses that are taken, one course is being completed. And considering that's free training, we love that. We are so excited that it's getting a lot of use, and we look forward to it um, continuing. And if you use FedVT and you want to see something added, let us know. Uh, we appreciate the feedback. So one thing we get constantly asked is, what certifications do I need? Um, our positions don't actually require any sort of specific certification. What we've listed here for you is a list of popular certifications. These are certifications that we have heard from um, other folks in the industry that uh, the information that you will learn by gaining by obtaining these certifications will help prepare you for a cyber position um, in either federal or in the private sector. Um, but again, these aren't necessarily required for a federal position. 
um, and uh, for sure it's not required uh, in order to get a job with DHS or MPPD. Um, some of these certifications are also available on the FedVTE website as well. And so we wanted to also talk a little bit about um, resume tips and tricks. And you may have heard that a federal resume is longer than your average resume. And to an extent this is true. Your uh, federal resume is going to be about two to four pages in length. I've seen much, much, much longer resumes. Uh, there's no need to go all crazy and you know put out 30 pages. And yes, I've seen 30 page resumes. I'm sorry, that was probably mine. My bad. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> but the reason why federal resumes are a little bit longer than private sector resume is because you need to put a lot of detail into the work experience that you've gained. And when I say lots of detail, the detail needs to be relevant to the position that you're applying for. So if you're applying for a cybersecurity job, you don't necessarily need to go into a lot of detail about your summer lifeguard position. Um, that's great. Show it on your resume to show that you, um, you know, your employment history. But really what you want to focus on is anything that you've done that has given you some cybersecurity experience. So I always tell students to, um, if you can, and if you're involved in any kind of cyber competition, put that on your resume and add it, you know, bullet it out like you would any other job experience because you're meeting with a group, um, you know, a month or so before the actual competition. You're um, preparing for the competition. You actually go through the competition. You may be doing some physical hacking or um, some assessment of some sort. So those are all things that you're actually doing. So make sure that you give yourself credit for all of that. And the other thing you want to do is make sure that you use keywords. So if you have any specific computer languages or if you do have certifications, make sure to put all of that on there. Um, and include the jargon because recruiters now have access to go in and what we call, we, we call it resume mining. So if you have created your uh, USA Jobs profile and if you have uploaded your resume and marked it as searchable, I can log in and I can search for keywords and your resume may pop up. And you, know, you may get a call or an email from a recruiter saying, hey, we have this position. Why don't you consider applying for it? And so really what you should do when you're talking about looking at your resume and expanding on the details, ask yourself what questions. So what, what were you challenged to do? And how did you go about doing it? And who did the project affect? What was the impact? And what results did you obtain? What numbers can you use to quantify it? And also don't forget that volunteer experience counts too. So don't forget to put that on there as well. And the number one, hands down, biggest mistake that I see, um, particularly with student resumes, is omitting the month and the year for the experience. This is really important. Don't just put summer 2017. You know, make sure you put May through August 2017. And make sure that you tell us that if your internship was full-time or part-time, because a lot of times, um, if it's an internship, if you worked full time, we may not um, know that and we may not give you credit for all that experience. You have to tell us how much you worked. And then finally, I wanted to give everyone a um, kind of a snapshot of the anatomy of a federal job announcement. So what you see here on the screen is a screenshot from, this is a current job announcement that is posted right now. Um, so if you have a master's degree, you can go and apply to this job right now. It's on USA Jobs. So here you can see the basics of the announcement. Uh, when you do a keyword search, this is what you're first going to see. You're going to see a list of uh, all the, the jobs that meet the query. So you're going to see the job title, the starting salary, the grade, the agency and the department, how long the announcement is open for. So let's go ahead and break this down. So in the federal government, we have job title requirements. An IT specialist is the catch-all title that we use for jobs that fall in the computer science and IT career field. InfoSec, that's really short for information security. The translated, this means that an InfoSec IT specialist job is really a cybersecurity specialist job. And this sometimes is called a 2210, and that's HR speak for an IT job. So when you search for your, your uh, cyber career positions, you want to search for keywords such as cyber, infosec, or you can even search by 2210, the number 2210. 
And if you look at this job, this job is uh, a GS 9, 11, and 12. And so this position is for candidates who either, either already have a master's degree, um, and the master's degree should be in IT, computer science, or cybersecurity, or a similar field. Um, or for candidates who do have experience, you're looking at somebody that has one to three years of experience. This is who should be applying for this particular job. If you have four to five years of experience, you might want to look at higher graded positions, 12 or 13, potentially even 14. And if you have, um, if you're a senior professional in the field, you've been working for a while, you should be looking for 14s and 15s. And by the way, we have all of those positions currently posted on USA Jobs right now. Um, go apply, that's what she's saying. <laughs> go now. Okay. Wait till the webinar's over, then go apply. And what you'll see on here is that this position is open until December. This is open for a really long time, and this is intentional. Um, especially what, what you'll notice is different is that a lot of times federal jobs are only open for about a week. Um, but ours are open for longer because we're constantly recruiting. We're constantly building our pipeline. Um, and you'll also notice that this job is um, a little broad, and this is so that we can recruit for any one of those divisions in CSNC that we just talked about. So um, we pull the list of resumes every 30 days, and the hiring managers get to look at those resumes every 30 days. If you're called for an interview, that's when you would learn more about the specifics of the role that they're considering you for. And so just in general, for other positions, um, when you click on the job announcement and you really get into the full uh, uh, job announcement, uh, if you look at the responsibility section and the qualifications section, that's really where you're going to see what the specific job is about. Um, and another question is, um, you'll see, uh, if you go back, you'll see that this job is open to all U.S. citizens. Uh, U.S. citizenship is required for this position because it requires a security clearance. And also, you'll find um, the citizenship requirements for federal positions when you click on the announcement and open it, and that will also be under the requirements section. And can I just add a couple quick things, too? Um, sometimes for people, they don't always think, what is a GS-9 versus an 11 or a 12? Um, definitely do a, a quick search on, you can look up kind of GS pay scale and take a look at what those numbers actually translate to so you can kind of get an idea of the, the money you would potentially be making. And it also will help you kind of see um, where you think that you best fit, whether it's a 9 or 11, and know that you're going to have to kind of justify why you deserve to be um, considered for that level. Um, and additionally, I also wanted to say, to Amanda's point, that's where the keywords are going to come in handy when you're doing your resume, looking through that job announcement and really picking out those words that you could utilize in your resume, um, showing that you have that experience. So take a look at it all. I know sometimes it can look a little vague, feel a little bit vague, but uh, having those keywords in there in your resume that match that job description are going to be extremely helpful to you. Mm -hmm. And um, in the resources that we've uh, included in the webinar today, there's um, a link included where you can go to the USA Jobs website, and there's step-by-step -step instructions on how you can apply a create, well, how you can create your account, um, how you can search for jobs, and how to apply. Um, specifically, we wanted to point out um, that you can receive notification in your inbox whenever a job opens up that you're interested in. So if you'd like to. Um, know when MPPD posts new positions, um, particularly our internship positions. These are also posted on USA Jobs. So um, go ahead and create your account. And when you're logged in, you want to do a keyword search for our directorate name, National Protection and Programs Directorate. Um, and it will actually auto-populate when you start to type it in. Um, and then once you get to the search page, there will be a little link in the upper left of the search, and it'll just you'll just click it. It says save this search, um, and that will uh, for the next year send you an email every single morning uh, with all the new job op openings that are posted. And you can have multiple searches saved. So you can have one um, just for NPPD. You could have one just for internships, or one just for recent grad programs. So um, any keyword search that you do, you can save. And it's really the best way. So to, to be immediately notified whenever a new opportunity is posted. 
And that's extremely important too in those, those cases where the job isn't open very long. Um, there's no worse a feeling that uh, you go on, you, you click around, and you find a job you feel completely qualified for and see that the application window closes tonight. And so then you're frantically trying to prepare your resume, prepare those applications, get through the process, and hope that your internet connection doesn't go down or that the site doesn't uh, go down in some way. So to Amanda's point, sign up now, create an account, get that resume ready so that you are prepared to apply um, when that job, that dream job comes available. And I will also say, particularly for the internship programs, there's a lot of agencies that um, the announcements will be open for five days or until they reach a certain number of applicants. And you know, if they reach 500 applicants, let's say, uh, that job will close that night. And so the job announcement will close earlier so, than, than the actual posting date. And that will be posted right on the announcement. But just a note that if you see that, you really want to take the time to apply that day. Okay. And so uh, for that, we also wanted to make sure that you know how to stay in touch with us. Um, our LinkedIn page, we have a corporate LinkedIn page where we also post a lot of opportunities. Um, and if we're going to be at a recruiting event, um, we, we DHS in the past has, uh, post, uh, has uh, hosted uh, one-stop shop recruiting events. They're typically in the D.C. area. but. Um, if we do that again, we'll definitely make sure to post those on our social media pages. So this is a really good way for you to keep in touch and to be the first to know when we do have recruiting events happening. And so for that, um, we'll leave the rest of the time open for questions. Great. Thank you. Well, you guys have given us a lot of really helpful information, and I think we've gotten quite a few few questions in through the chat box, so we'll just dive right in. Again, if you have a question, please enter your questions into the chat box. The moderators will capture those questions. We're going to do our best to answer as many of them as we can today, but for any question we're not able to answer today, we will get you a response uh, in a follow-up message that comes out after today's webinar. So just to get started, are there any cybersecurity programs, seminars, or workshops that adults or young people can attend for networking purposes? Um, these are kinds of resources I wish I had known a little bit more about when I was going through uh, my cybersecurity program. But I'd also add, uh, so first off, I'd check into the CAEs and the SFS schools because whether you're a part of that school or not or you just want to learn more, um, that's a really great way to get connected with the cyber community. Um, and, and additionally, um, whether you feel like you have a high technical level or not, check out cyber defense competitions. Um, whether they're high school and you could be maybe a mentor or a coach, um, or even if you're in college, they have things like CCDC where you can join um, as a participant. And there's also numerous cyber, de uh, cyber defense competitions, capture the flag competitions uh, virtually and in person across the country. And um, you might not immediately think of those as networking, but what's the really cool part about those opportunities are those organizations will often bring in some pretty awesome people, um, military folks that come in and mentor, or there might be guest speakers at the closing or opening ceremonies. Those are the kinds of people that you want to be talking to and networking with um, that will help get your resume further uh, through the process. And additionally, check out meetup groups, those types of networking activities. Um, obviously, in the D.C. area, there's a fair amount of them. Um, but check out virtual and in-person ones. You, it's amazing just by talking and working on your elevator pitch um, how you can kind of find out opportunities that aren't even visible online because uh, our huge stat lately that we've been talking about is uh, through recent research there will be 1.8 million jobs available in cybersecurity by the year 2022. So um, whether you work for DHS and then you move on to private sector, you come back or you work for any uh, government agency or private sector, um, you're helping defend the nation. So go out there, start networking, um, and, and we wish you the best of luck with that. Great. And what would you say is the hardest part of working uh, in cybersecurity? giving webinars in front of hundreds of people. Um, I guess in addition to that, uh, just a constant change. Um, you know, people say, oh, I, I can deal with change. But when you are faced with a project um, that 
there is no background information on. Cybersecurity is such a young industry. Um, sometimes you don't have all the pieces you need, and so you really have to rely on your teammates. Um, but in that same vein, as soon as you're halfway through the project and you've really gained traction, the threat shifts. A new breach has taken place, new technology has come out, or you're just reassigned to something else. So it, it really takes that agility and that resilience and that adaptability um, that you aren't always expecting. And I think it's exciting, but that can be one of the hardest parts um, because it's just this constantly moving target. Um, hopefully we can we'll continue to get in front of some of those types of things, but um, a lot of times it's building something new for the task at hand or for the vulnerability at hand, closing up shop and, and working on the next thing. Great. So what really sets a, a career with MPPD apart from the cyber, from the private sector? I would say, to, to mimic a little bit about what uh, Princess was talking about, is that, you know, there are challenges that um, the folks that, that work in ZSNC, they don't even know about until they get to the incident site. So um, some of the, the incident responders will actually travel um, to go to the site and to do their work, and um, they will be presented with something they've never seen before, and they have to, you know, come up with a solution while they're there. And one of the things that I learned this week is that they come back to the office, and then, you know, they have the opportunity to present um, what they learned and, you know, this new threat to their colleagues, and so they're hosting brown bags, and, and it's a continually learning environment. But also I've heard from other people that, you know, it's the work-life balance that, uh, that we have that allows them, you know, that makes their, it so much more rewarding for them because, um, you know, somebody's not calling you at 2 o'clock in the morning unless, you know, you're a senior leader <laughs> um, to, you know, come in and work on a crisis or something. Um, people come in and they do their 40 hours a week and they go home. Um, and if they're working some type of threat case, a, you know, there's procedures in place to give them time off if they've had to work a little bit extra. So there really is that work-life balance that's put in to the office. And I'd also just add that through MPPD, you are working with private sector all the time. So what I love is that you're exposed to it um, without necessarily being a part of it. Um, there's even sometimes opportunities to go work with private sector entities for a project and then come back um, and, and share that knowledge that you've learned. And so I, I love that we are able to interact with the private sector and help them uh, work through their challenges as well as collaborating on solutions. So to me, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Um, to Amanda's point, you can kind of close up on your day and go home and have a life um, without wor working 80 hours necessarily. Um, but you can also have that impact on private sector um, organizations and have those relationships with them, which I think is pretty cool. Great. Well, you've talked a lot about what it's like uh, and the roles within MPPD, but what's a typical day like for you working uh, within MPPD? Um, so I'll give like my very specific example, um, and then we have a couple others that our colleagues have given us too, but I manage um, awareness programs for uh, MPPD and cybersecurity awareness specifically. So we're taking a look at um, what are the types of challenges that everyday people face? What makes cybersecurity difficult to understand? And how do we build out Pro, uh, how we build out products and communications to help make life a little bit easier so people don't fall uh, prey to scams and, and other issues like that. Or when their kid comes home from school and is talking about the newest app or technology that they want, it's not completely over their head and they're panicked because they've never heard of that, that technology before. Um, so we do a lot of collaborating and a lot of talking uh, with people. We're, we're doing research and we're, we're identifying what is trending at the moment and how we can be a part of the conversation. So it's a lot of coordination, but it's also um, a fair amount of traveling. I love the days where I get to go travel to um, another, another city, another state, and, and present on the work that we're doing and the resources that we have. So 
Um, that's not everybody. Um, to Amanda's point earlier, you know, NCIC is a lot of analysis, and so they're oftentimes hands to keyboard working on things, and we all have those days where we kind of have to come back and write up reports or do research or be on the phone. Um, but there are a lot of days where you get away from your cubicle or away from your desk or office, and you get to go interact with people and go solve the problems that you just heard in the morning news or that you just read about in the newspaper. Um, do you have any other uh, any programming languages? Um, to what Amanda said at one point, talk about the context. What problem did you solve? What project did you have in class where maybe you took the lead? Or maybe you were the, the key component that made that project successful. I don't always think we give ourselves enough credit, um, and we want to hire you. So give us a good, a good reason to do so, and let your resume shine. So a couple of questions we got in from the, from the chat box. How hard is it to make the transition from a, for someone who may have started their career in a non-cyber field uh, into the cybersecurity field? And, and are there things you can recommend that might help them make that transition? Um, I think when you're looking to transition, um, they're really looking for an understanding of the foundations of cybersecurity. So you know you, you understand um, networks and you know how they talk to each other. Uh, and things like that, you know, understand that it may be you may take a pay cut to come on uh, when you're changing jobs. Um, it, it really just depends on uh, how much of that foundational knowledge that, that you have. But I would say, you know, going to the certifications while they're not required for the job, going through that learning um, or taking a certification a certificate class, um, maybe even at a community college, that's going to give you the foundational skills uh, to help you get your foot in the door. Great. So for students who are interested in applying for an internship, how much knowledge and experience are, are you looking for specifically in cybersecurity uh, for those folks who are trying to get into the, to the intern program? Well, the great news is, is you don't need any. Uh, yeah. <laughs> For interns, um, and even for the recent grads, really all they're looking for is the education, that you're interested in cybersecurity. Um, and, and that's how you get hired, is, is you're enrolled in a program um, and you're seeking a degree. And I would say you know, that's one thing that our hiring managers look for, is they look for somebody who's interested in the field and who's um, interested in continually learning about the field because, as we mentioned before, this is an ever-changing field, and it's such a young thing. And um, you know, our cyber analysts are just constantly coming across new things. Um, and so that's the environment that we work in: is that we're looking for people who are innovative, who are creative, and you know, who are you know looking to solve the puzzle. That's great. Well, thank you, and I want to thank both of you for taking the time out today to to speak to some of our participants and give them some of the valuable information you've shared. Uh, we appreciate your participation in today's webinar. Before we end today's session, though, I want to make sure well, you take an opportunity to answer some of our polling. So real quick, I want to apologize about the phone call given out. Um, the, I can't really do anything about it. Google just like killed it. I guess you can only have it on mute, mute for a while. But um, and, and getting back in, it was just a pain. So there was a chunk that was missing, but it was not too critical from the looks of it. The uh, and also sorry about my voice. I'm dealing with allergies, and I wasn't planning on making a video until after, but I forgot about this. So as far as things goes, um, I, I want to get into some things that they didn't get into in that little segment, mostly because they can't or maybe they don't have experience into this particular stuff. So I've been living with people who work for the state or federal, and I've, I've seen it from senior level all the way down. I've seen the good, bad, and ugly, mostly the bad and ugly. And I can tell you some pitfalls. So first things first is one of the biggest pitfalls I've found is if you work for either one, even corporate, make sure if, if you're going to be working remote, fully remote. So when they say remote uh, telework, they might be talking about every other Friday or every Friday or something like that, which is a lot of places do that now. But um, you might be going for fully remote. So, you know, you m might ask that and they'd say, okay. Well, you need to make sure that it is written down. The reason why, 
Here's a quick story. One of my parents, they actually were promised a fully remote position. The uh, We had a house up here in North Carolina, and we're living now in Florida, and paying two house bills doesn't make sense, and Florida kind of sucked. So we went to North Carolina. Well, the thing is, is the uh, job, they the boss automatically said, hey, um, we need you here, physically here from here on out. And this was before the thing even started. Then there was an argument going back and forth. And basically what it came down to is since the telework promise, and, and it was a verbal promise from the boss itself, since it was not written down, they didn't have to honor it. And they didn't honor it. So basically the person who got the job, who, who uh, you know, did whatever they were supposed to, they got screwed over and they had to travel two or three hours um, out to go to work and even rent hotels and whatever because that's a ridiculous drive because keep in mind that's about six hours round trip. So that's, that's a big thing to note is make sure you get this stuff in writing. I've personally seen people get screwed over with this. And I'm, I've also seen it in, in corporate. So it's not just federal and um i've never seen it in state but it, it, you know if it happened in federal if it happened in corporate it's going to happen in state so make sure it's written down and that way you can point at it and say you need to honor this because you sign it so with that that that's a big thing to note um and unfortunately that might cost you from getting some jobs and whatever but if that's important to you then you need to stick to your grounds otherwise it will run you over and also another thing, I've seen it where some bosses, the next boss will come up and they will, even though the former boss was cool with telework, the next boss might not be and would require everybody to not be telework. Now with federal and state, you can justify things and, and protect your job to some level. With corporate, I've seen them just wipe everybody out and just replace them. And um, so that, that's a big thing to note. And that, so it happens across the board. But that is also something to note. Again, you need to make sure your stuff is in writing. So, big thing to note is that. Now, as far as other things that you need to note is um, travel. This is a huge thing that you, you might want to note. If um, you work for uh, the, the state, if you got to do travel, most likely you're just traveling around the state itself. And uh, sometimes it can even be in the county itself, so it's not that bad. Where if it's federal, the travel probably is, like say for example, again, I'm here in North Carolina. So if I work for federal and had travel, I might be traveling to, for all I know, California, Hawaii, or whatever. Unlike something state-wise where at most I might be, depending on the state, might be an hour, two hours, three hours or more out of way. I can go home if need be. The fact is, is there's no way to get home driving wise from California that easy. It's it just not, it doesn't happen and it, it won't happen. So that's, that's something to note is, um, you got to deal with things like that and, and there's trade-offs. Also on some states, there's actually better benefits than federal. So keep in mind that before you jump into one or the other, take a look at their benefits and, uh, and some of them are better in one versus the other um another thing is is um and I, I think north carolina benefits it was or is still is better than federal i, I can't remember to be exact it might be an equivalent to I, I i also can't remember exact but i know some states it, it, it is so with that one in mind that's um the the requirements the the uh, experience and all that stuff between state and federal, it's it's virtually the same. So, you know, if, if you can find a job state-wise, then probably if it's available in, in federal, it's probably going to be the same requirements, same all the other stuff. Um, you know, it just might be different locations and, and whatever. So with that one in mind, that's a big thing that you need to note. Um, obviously, look in your own state to make sure that there's jobs there and whatever. But hopefully this whole thing's helped you out. So make sure everything is in writing, in also uh, in writing whenever you get a job and whatever. And note that some of these jobs will require some uh, security clearance. So this means that you you need to be 
okay with the uh, people interviewing your parents, interviewing your high school teachers, interviewing your neighbors and all in between. Believe it or not, that actually is part of some security clearances. So be okay with that. It tends to not be that much of a problem unless you got like some type of criminal background or something like that. But um, as far as that goes, um, if you got any questions, anything else, then leave it down below. I will leave links down below to stuff that can help you out, um, some documents and a few other things. But uh, feel free to leave a like, subscribe, share, and, and whatnot. And I'll see you next video. Hope you have a great day.